Plato's Symposium is one of the most profound and beautiful of the Platonic dialogues. Of all the dialogues in the Platonic corpus, it's the one that is probably the most poetic, and at the same time, it contains within it a treatment of reality, knowledge, virtue, the soul, freedom, slavery, good, evil. A remarkable concordance of important platonic themes come together in the symposium. And what I'd like to do first is talk about what a symposium is and what the context of this dialogue is. And I'd like to talk about the people who participate in it, specifically the people who spend their time talking to Socrates. And after that, I'd like to talk about what it is they say in specific. And then finally, I'd like to talk about what makes this a truly classic, a truly great work of art and philosophy at the same time. Possibly the hardest thing in the world to do is to write a great work of art or a great work of philosophy. But to write, to create a great work of art and a great work of philosophy at the same time requires a consummate genius. And that's why this is one of Plato's most important dialogues. It's perhaps second only to the Republic in terms of philosophical depth, and it's second to none in terms of poetic beauty. In the first case, the symposium is not narr narrated by someone that was actually there. It's narrated by a guy named Apollodorus, and he heard about this wonderful dinner party from someone that was actually there, and he got a good record of the speeches that people gave, and he decided that the account that he heard of this dinner party was so sublime, so perfect, so important, that he committed it to memory. And for that reason alone, it suggested something important, unusual, was happening at this dinner party, this philosophical meeting of great Greek intellects. What happens is something like this. The symposium, and symposium is not just a dinner party, it's a drinking party. It's a party in which people intend to go to get intoxicated, something on the order of a bachelor party nowadays. It's a kind of party where you go and drink, intentionally drinking beyond social drinking, drinking excessively. That's part of the entertainment. So the symposium is a kind of philosophical drunk, all right? And there's a tremendous comic element in combining low comedy, such as drunkenness and hysteria and the kind of crazy activities that you get when people become intoxicated, and high philosophy, high art. And the theme is perhaps the most sublime and important in the Platonic corpus. The theme is love. What love is, how love works, what sort of approach we should take towards love, and why it is important in our lives and in all lives. A remarkable intellectual and artistic achievement is what we're going to encounter today. A number of gentlemen Athenian aristocrats, essentially, the best, influential, wealthy, well-established gentlemen, get together at the house of a man named Agathon. Now, Agathon is a tragic poet. The symposium that he's holding at his house is a kind of celebration for the fact that he has just won a prize for producing the best tragedy in the competition that they hold for tragedies each year in Athens. So he's become a famous kind of best-selling author. And he's gotten the applause of all the citizens of Athens. Some 30,000 people went to see this series of plays he wrote. And apparently the tragedies were so fine that he carried off first prize. So it's at a poet's house. It's among literary men. And Agathon himself is feeling very good, very proud of himself, proud of his achievements. And he wants to share his joy with his friends. So he invites a bunch of them over. And we get to meet some of the great literary and philosophical intellects of Greece, or Athens at the time. And Agathon is certainly none, not, second to none as far as these go. In addition to Agathon, the host of the evening, there are probably 10 or 15 others at this party. And you have to remember what the, uh, the, kind of the geography of the Greek dining room is like before you realize what's going on here. They don't sit at a big table the way do, we do at Thanksgiving dinner. They don't sit down and use knives and forks. They recline on couches. So it's a very relaxed, luxurious kind of, a, of an activity. And if you're going to get drunk, it's, already, it's nice to be horizontal when you start out. Because that way, if you're going to be drinking to excess, you don't have any place to fall to. So they're all going to sit around the table, and slaves are going to wait on them, and they're going to be brought large quantities of wine, and they're going to drink to toast the success of Agathon in the theater. So these gentlemen get together. We get Agathon. In addition, there are a number of people who don't talk, but among the speakers, there are some excellent creatures, excellent examples of the Greek literary mind. There's a young man named Phaedrus. Phaedrus is the interlocutor, is the respondent in one of the great platonic dialogues. 
He is a clever, intelligent, handsome, well-spoken young man. He represents the best in Athenian culture, and he is a particular favorite of Socrates because he has a philosophical nature. He is dialectical, he is a good thinker, he is a good talker, and he's just the sort of guy we'd want to invite in to get his views on love. If you ever get a chance to read the corpus of the Platonic Dialogues, and you're looking at the symposium, and I hope that you do after hearing this lecture, you should certainly turn to the Phaedrus as well. The Phaedrus is also concerned with the topic of love, and it's not accidental that Phaedrus is going to be here, and he's going to be able to give a speech on the topic of love. In addition to Phaedrus and Agathon, we also have Pausanias. Pausanias is an important and quasi-aristocratic figure. He participates in Greek intellectual and philosophical discussion, and he too is, represents the best in Athenian society. Handsome, charming, literate, well-spoken, witty, just the sort of man we'd want into a platonic dialogue. In addition to these two, we have Aristophanes, the greatest of the Greek comedians. And have you read Aristophanes? If you have, he represents the comic genius of Greece the dramatic artistic genius of Greece and in Plato's eyes he also represents all that's wrong with Greece. He represents the man who's entirely given up to bronze pleasures. There's a wonderful line when Aristophanes is first introduced in the dialogue. Someone suggests that, uh, says that Aristophanes is a very pious man on account of the fact that he has spent his whole life worshipping Dionysus and Aphrodite which means that he's a chronic drunk and a woman chaser which shows you just how pious he is. All right? So we've made not only divinities of our vices, but we've also decided to create art which will justify them and perhaps give these vices to other people. Aristophanes is the bad poet of the Republic who must be censored because his poetry drives people from ignorance to worse ignorance, from mere ignorance to outright vice. So Aristophanes is going to uh, play a very important part in the symposium. He is in some respects the anti-Socrates. He is a man who is not only a bronze man, but he knows what he's doing and he likes it. All right. He's hedonistic and he's got an attitude about it. He's decided to tell everyone else that this is the only way worth living. The satisfaction of vehement desires, one after another, as much as conceivably possible, is what it means to be a human being. Now, in the Republic, Socrates had a, a name for people like this. And when you collect them together in a big bunch, they form a city. And this is the city of swine. And Aristophanes is pig number one. He's the greatest of pigs. He's an articulate pig. He's a poetic pig. He's a gifted pig, which is what makes him a dangerous pig. Yes, Aristophanes is going to get his. Not only is Aristophanes a dangerous man, and not only is he a pig, but he's also had the temerity, the nerve, to write a play about Socrates. It's called The Clouds. Has any, if you've only read The Clouds, what it is is a kind of lampoon of Greek philosophy. In particular, Socrates is in that play, and Socrates is mocked, scorned, made to seem a foolish man who's been inquiring into things that no man could possibly understand or have any good use for. No, Aristophanes has lampooned Socrates, and now in this dialogue, Plato is going to go for payback. Now, Aristophanes gets his. So, since Aristophanes isn't writing this, he's going to have to say whatever Plato wants him to say. And he's going to say kind of grunting, swinish things all through this. And people are going to find him very interesting and, and intriguing. But he's going to pay, one after another, all the qualities which are attributed to Aristophanes here are the qualities which we are going to associate with the bronze man, the tyrannical man, the evil man. And what makes him worse is that not only is he bronze, evil, and tyrannical, he's also the sort of man that talks very well as well. All right? So not only is he articulate, but he's also articulate in an evil way. So taken together, that's the worst possible combination of human characteristics. The anti-Socrates makes his appearance. Also, irony is a constant literary trophy in this, as in all the Platonic dialogues. And one of the great ironies of this piece of work is that the comedian is going to provide us with comic relief. The comedian turns out to be the clown. And we're going to make fun of him all through this. So this is going to be, at the same time, hilarious comedy and also high art and also among the greatest works of Greek philosophy. An amazing intellectual achievement. Now let's go to our other guests. We have a couple of other important ones. We have one named Eryximachus. Eryximachus is a doctor and as soon as you hear the word doctor in any of the platonic dialogues, always freeze 
right? Because doctoring and medicine are big metaphors in the Republic, and they are central metaphors in all of Platonic thinking. As soon as you hear the word doctor, you should think, is he a doctor of the body or a doctor of the soul? Well, it turns out in this case, Eryximachus is a regular old doctor. He's a doctor of the body. When you get hurt, when your arm gets broken, he fixes you. If you get a disease, he cures you. He takes care of bodies. If you remember from the Republic, Socrates is the doctor of souls. Socrates is the man who diagnoses soul sickness prescribes remedies for the sicknesses of the soul? Well, the tension, the conflict, and the resolution of such conflicts between body and soul is in some respect the main theme of the symposium. And we are going to find a transition from the man who is merely a doctor of bodies to a man who is a doctor of souls. From a concern with the welfare of the body to a concern with the welfare of the soul. From a concern with pleasures of this world to pleasures of the higher, superior world from concerns about the cave and its shadows to concerns about ultimate reality. An amazing intellectual achievement. Beyond Eryximachus and Aristophanes and Agathon, we are also going to have a number of other interlocutors, most of whom are given the chance to give a speech, and all these speeches lead up to Socrates. Socrates' speech is going to be, in some respects, the high point of this dialogue, and his praise of love will be the true praise of love, which will show all these earlier attempts at rhetoric to be inferior, to be not based upon true knowledge and true understanding. And, although that would seem like a logical way of concluding this dialogue, it doesn't end there, because we're going to go for a complete comic resolution of all these tensions. At the end of the dialogue, Alcibiades, perhaps the greatest of the bad Greeks, makes an appearance, and he's stone drunk. He's howling drunk when he arrives, and he introduces his typical decorum to the party. As a result, we move from sobriety to intoxication. We move from philosophy to hedonism. We move down the divided line so that Socrates has been so laborious trying to bring us up. So Alcibiades will come in at the end of it, and if you know Thucydides' Peloponnesian Wars, Alcibiades is one of the most important of the democratic Greek politicians. Alcibiades has everything in the world going for him. He is rich. He is handsome. He is intelligent. He is articulate. The only drawback is that he is bad. He is very, very bad. He is a lover of pleasure. He is a lover of honors. He is a lover of anything except the things that Socrates thinks he ought to love, which is knowledge, wisdom, and virtue. He is a particular friend of Socrates. and. He has a great deal to say about Socrates. He is going to be the only one who does not give a speech about the nature of love. He will give us a speech about the nature of Socrates. And his speech in praise of Socrates will resolve and connect many of the philosophical themes that are proposed in the Republic and are continued in the Symposium. Parenthetically, before I go on to the actual plot of the discipline or plot of the dialogue, all of the Platonic dialogues fit together. They mesh together like parts of a jigsaw puzzle. They do not exist by themselves the way a particular piece of music from, say, Beethoven will. All of these connect to each other. The metaphors that are established in the Republic, like uh, the myth of the cave or the gold, silver, and bronze in your soul, will be recapitulated and reviewed in great dialogues like the Symposium, and all of them presuppose each other. They form a kind of circle, a kind of ring, in which one idea is connected to the other, and together they form an entire comprehension, an entire assessment of the human condition. So make no mistake, when I come and do this symposium, I'm really doing platonic ideas just in this particular instantiation. And they're really going to have everything to do with what you heard last time when we, we reviewed the Republic. So let's think about the actual plot. They're all getting together at Agathon's house. And Socrates isn't going there, but all of a sudden on the way, he falls into a fit of abstraction. He starts to think. And the problem with Socrates is he thinks a little too much. It's not normal. It's not healthy. And he's just sitting there in rapt attention like this. His friend decides to go on without him. It's very hard to drag Socrates in like this. As a consequence, he's late for the party. When the other members of the party arrive at the symposium, one of them says, well, what kind of a party are we going to have tonight, gentlemen? Remember what last night's party was like? And most of them say no, right, because they've been drinking excessively at that point, so none of them remember what last night's party is like. And one of them says, are you sure you want to drink heavily tonight? I'm really still hungover from yesterday. And all of them say, you know, I also am hungover from yesterday, and I'll tell you, I just can't keep the pace up that we're living. We're drinking heavily. We really are having a very good time. We're pursuing pleasure with a kind of frenzied abandon because we know no other good. So they decide 
not because they're drawn to the good, not because they're drawn to moderation, but because it's just too hard on the body and mind, or the body and, and the, the mental faculties, that they're going to have a sober evening. Now, the irony here, of course, is that later on in the evening, they're all going to get drunk because they haven't got the willpower, they haven't got the philosophical knowledge, they haven't got the healthiness of the soul which allows them to achieve the platonic virtues. But they're trying their best. They say, at least, while our bodies won't put up with it, we'll try and stay sober for a while. In particular, Eric Simicus, our doctor, he says, gentlemen, I'd like to point out to you, now that we've decided to have a sober evening, that overindulgence in alcohol is a very bad thing for the human body. Note the emphasis on the human body. It's a very bad thing for the human body. And he says, furthermore, that I can never be part of any intent to consume excessive amounts of alcohol, particularly when I'm still hungover from last night. Right? Constant juxtaposition of low comedy and high philosophical thought is what makes us one of the great works of art in the Western tradition. Well, they sit down, and Socrates eventually arrives after the dinner has already been served. The symbolic import being that Socrates is not ter terribly concerned with food or drink. He's concerned with taking care of his soul, which is why he stayed where he was, thinking about things until he con continued and completed the thought that he had. Socrates' soul comes first. All the rest of these guys, they get together, and body comes first. They eat, they drink, they sit down, and they decide that they're going to have a sober evening because they have no choice. Th their bodies won't hold up to it. As soon as they decide to have a sober evening, they also decide to get rid of the flute girl. The flute girl is a hired prostitute. But since their sex lives are as scandalous as their, you know, as their consumption of alcohol, they've decided that, look, they have to moderate themselves a little bit out of physical necessity rather than out of philosophical obligation. We're going to get rid of alcohol for the time being. We're going to get rid of sex for the time being. And we're going to move into the realm of pure discussion. And what they decide to do is hold a discussion on love. What they propose to do is all sitting around this table, drinking a little bit of wine for the sake of refreshment, not, of course, to get drunk. They're going to discuss love, and they're going to try and discern what love is, how you find out about love, what properties love has, and why we ought to be concerned with love. Why is love an important element in human life? And so they agree that they're all going to give encomia on love. An encomium is a speech in praise of someone. Right? And their encomia on love are going to try and capture what makes love important, why love should be of concern to either the philosophical person or the one that just wants to dry out for the evening. And in either case, their statements about love will tell us a great deal about the workings of their inner psyche, about what sort of men they are. You can almost say that you can find out about a person by the sort of things that they love and the sort of love that they have and that that tells you all you need to know about the inner workings of the soul. And of course, this transition from their body to their soul, to find out what the real marrow of them is, is the essence of Platonism and what the Platonic dialogues are all about. They're all concerned with soul rather than body. There are seven speeches. Socrates bats cleanup. He comes in sixth. And then at the end, we'll get Alcibiades. The first speech is by Phaedrus. Now, Phaedrus is a handsome, intelligent, articulate young man and he gives a very, what we might call a silver-souled interpretation of love. Love, he, Phaedrus says, is a god. A god that inspires us to do virtuous, famous, glorious things. And he gives some examples of the kind of virtuous, famous, glorious things that love inspires us to do. And he quotes from Homer saying that Achilles, motivated by love, would never do anything dishonorable and won himself immortal fame and glory among all human beings because he was motivated by love. Love motivates, in other words, the heroic man to the Homeric virtues, the virtues of Achilles, the virtues of the Homeric heroes, the men who were valorous in war, never were afraid, were completely courageous, maybe not especially smart, not terribly philosophical, but it allowed them at least to do glorious things. In other words, love allows us to move from bronze concerns in life to silver concerns. It takes us halfway up because his conception of love is a halfway house between common lust and the platonic conception of love, which we will get at the end. So we're moving halfway up the divided line here. Love, in Phaedrus's view, it's an incomplete but still noble-minded view, is that which motivates us, which prods us and stimulates us to do heroic actions. Now, Phaedrus gives a lovely speech. It's moving, and thank God it's short. He runs right through it, tells us that love makes us do wonderful things, and everyone's very pleased with the young man. He's acquitted himself quite well. Obviously, talking with Socrates, as he does in, oh, in the other dialogue called the Phaedrus, has done him some good. He may not know everything, but at least he can talk. All right. Phaedrus finishes his speech, and the next speech is by a, another man named Pausanias. And Pausanias 
gives a very fine speech which improves on the speech of Phaedrus. It's worth noting here that each one of these speeches improves or falls back from the earlier speech. You can think of the symposium as being organized the way a piece of classical music is organized. There is a kind of conceptual tension between the speeches. And you are either raising that tension by increasing the volume and tempo of the ideas, or you are decreasing the tempo, the tempo decreasing the connection by sliding off into some absurd kind of speech, which will happen when we deal with the next speech. But let's come back to Pausanias. Pausanias tells us something very important. Pausanias tells us that love is a god, which is a very important idea, that it's, not, it's something divine, it's not merely human. And in addition, not only is love a god, but love somehow helps us reconcile the different elements in our emotional life. And love, in some respect, allows us to unify the dissonant elements in our psyche. It allows us to create a harmony of the soul, analogous to the harmony that we might get in a healthy body. In addition to that, he says that love is somehow connected with freedom and autonomy and virtue, which is very important because the kind of virtue we're talking about here is a virtue of the soul. It is not the Homeric virtue of the body. It doesn't mean turning yourself into Arnold Schwarzenegger. It means turning yourself into someone that is good of soul, not of body. That's what's important about Paul Sanius' speech. He improves on the speech of Phaedrus by moving the discussion from the effects of love on one's actions to the effect of one of love on one's soul, on one's inner self. Pausanias allows us to move on, up the divided line, away from body towards soul, and that's what's important about him. Now, Pausanias gives a very nice speech. He quits himself quite well. And now it's Aristophanes' turn. Aristophanes, the great comedian, is now to become the great clown. Aristophanes is about to give a wonderful speech about love, and doubtless he knows a great deal about love, because he's constantly worshipping Dionysus and Aphrodite. Right? He's a drunk and woman chaser, so he knows all about it, doubtless. And he would like to, but he's been overeating and overdrinking, so he gets the hiccups, and he's constantly doing this, and he's hiccuping, and he can't talk. Hiccuping in this case is symbolic. It's not just funny, and it is funny, because the idea of a guy trying to give a lovely, eloquent speech and having the hiccups because he's a drunk, all right, undercuts the seriousness and the gravity of the, t of the theme we're discussing. In addition to that, it turns out that he doesn't know what to do. He has to ask Eryximachus, you're the doctor, <coughs> help me out, I'm, I'm choking, I, I, have, I need some help, I can't give the speech, please, what can I do? Eryximachus, the doctor of bodies, prescribes, go gargle with water, and if you can't gargle with water, go tickle your nostrils with a feather so you'll sneeze. Sneezing, another kind of reaction, another kind of spasm. Alcibiades, or not Alcibiades, but uh, Aristophanes here, is made to be seen as the man that is nothing but physical. He is a set of responses to physical stimuli. He hiccups, he laughs, he sneezes, he pops around the room, constantly prey to physical stimuli. He almost is a man without a soul. He's the ultimate swine. And he's happy like that, too. He doesn't know what it would be like to miss having a soul. He's a pig. So naturally, our pig needs a physical cure, and he's going to get that from the Dr. Eric Simicus. So he goes in and tickles his nostril with a feather, and while he's in there performing this glorious operation, Eric Simicus decides to take his place in the speeches. And Eric Simicus, our doctor of souls, or our doctor of bodies, says, in continuing the argument that had been put together by Pausanias, he says that not only does love reconcile discordant elements in the body, it also reconciles discordant elements in the soul. Since Eryximachus is a doctor, he says that love is actually the origin of the medical art because it shows us how to reconcile disharmonious elements in our physical structure to create the thing we call health of the body. In addition to that, by a kind of extrapolation, love also allows us to glue together the opposite and dissonant elements of the soul to form a harmonious, complete whole which makes us both blessed and virtuous and wise. So, for Eric Simicus, love is a god. Love is a god which allows us to create harmony out of dissonance, which allows us to create unity out of plurality, which allows us to create human being out of the comings and goings, out of, the, out of human becoming. It allows us to create something permanent and eternal. It asks us to perfect ourselves and to perfect those that we love. So, Eric Simicus' speech is very moving. It's a very beautiful speech. And it's rather brief, and it just serves to fill in until Aristophanes can be brought out and lampooned. He's back now. Eric Simicus is just about finished with his speech, and we bring in Aristophanes, the low comedian. 
And he points out immediately that, Eric Simicus, you're a wonderful doctor. I was in there sneezing and having these various spasms, hiccuping, and now I'm back and I'm ready to talk. One of the most important ironies here is that Aristophanes' speech will be another series of verbal hiccups. It will be a series of spasms that he doesn't, cannot control and does not understand and nobody else understands them either. He is going to make up a series of myths which he believes accounts for love, but it only accounts for Aristophanes' kind of love. It accounts for the physical, the animal, the brutal sort of love. It accounts for bronze love, love in the sense of lust, love in the sense of the copulation of animals rather than the union of human beings. It is physical love. And Aristophanes gives us a wonderful myth. And it's just like poets when they don't know what they're talking about to think up some myth that's dangerous to themselves and dangerous to others, that indicates their complete lack of understanding of the nature of philosophy and virtue and goodness. Funny it should turn out to be Aristophanes, the man who doesn't like Socrates. Works out very nicely. Well, what Aristophanes says is this. Way back many, many years ago, at the very beginning of time, people didn't look like they do now. No, they were smacked together so that they had, in fact, two heads, four arms, four legs. And they all used to get around by doing cartwheels. You know the way clowns do at the circus? Right? Well, lots of people used to locomote themselves way back when, when we were smacked together. And there were three kinds of sex back then. There were combinations of two men, there were combinations of two women, and there were combinations of man and woman. And these creatures are actually our ancestors. They are what we are descended from. And that is the perfect human being. In other words, as we are now, we are not as we were at one time, and we are somehow limited, partial, incomplete. And this has everything to do with mythology and love. According to Aristophanes, the myth goes something like this. Back in the beginning of time when we all had two legs, four arms, four heads, or two legs, four arms, and four legs, back then, we tried to usurp the position of the gods. We were all sublimely happy because in this connection of bodies that we have, where the arms and the legs form one big hole and we all go cartwheeling around, it's analogous or very similar to a situation in which we are constantly joined in sexual connection. In other words, back in the, in the good old days, people had sex all the time constantly. And as a matter of fact, they couldn't help but have sex because they were physically, literally joined together. It wasn't possible to stop having sex. Aristophanes thinks that's great. He can't wait to go back to that. He'd love it. <laughs> it really pleases him to death. And of course, it's low comedy, no doubt. But because we were so sublimely happy, we decided to usurp our position and try and climb Mount Olympus and take away the posi position of the gods, to force the gods out and to make gods of ourselves. This made Zeus very upset. And Zeus was so upset, he sent down thunderbolts and decided to split human beings into two parts, into parts that you and I are now. Only one head per person, only two arms per person, only two legs. Split the human being into two, and thereafter, to teach them a lesson, move the heads around so they're looking in the opposite direction, move the genitals up, and then allow them to locomote on two legs instead of cartwheeling around the way they used to. And as a consequence of this, the human condition is one of incompletion. We are not complete. We are not finished. We constantly go about looking for our other half. And this, for Aristophanes, is what love is. It is not a god the way it was in the earlier speeches. It is a desire. It is a desire to have physical, bodily connection with something else that is the object of your desire. And it is because you are not complete as you are. Aristophanes' discussion is exclusively related to bodies. It has no mention of souls whatever. Because Aristophanes is a pig and doesn't know that he has a soul. May, hell, he may not have a soul. So Aristophanes is concerned with the union of bodies and with legitimizing and accounting for why we have such a cr tremendous lust to connect in a physical way. Or maybe he's trying to say that's why he has such a lust to connect in a purely physical way, since he's been such a devotee of Dionysus and Aphrodite. Perhaps what Aristophanes is doing here is trying to create a myth which legitimizes the uncontrolled lust and the crazy lunatic passion, the frenzy of physical desire that characterizes Aristophanes' whole life, the neglect of the philosophical development of one's soul in preference to continuous, vehement gratification of desire. So in other words, Aristophanes here is creating a lying myth which tells us why he is the way he is and which takes 
his behavior, his constant pursuit of pleasure, both in the cup and in the bed, as being not only normal but desirable given the way the gods have constructed the world. A very convenient myth if you think about it. Now at the end of his myth, it's a very entertaining idea, but he says that now all the people in the world are either heterosexual or there are women who are homosexual and there are men who are homosexual. And he accounts for heterosexuality, homosexuality in women and homosexuality in men by referring back to what they were originally. Whoever you were originally separated from when the gods split you off, well, of course, you're looking to connect up with that once again. And once you find that, you can't imagine anything that would make you happier than doing that. Now, Aristophanes has some important things to tell us about the gods here. This is an important religious myth. If we don't give appropriate sacrifices to the gods, and if we show them any kind of disrespect, Zeus may well take it in his head one day to drop a thunderbolt on us as we are, split us right down the middle, and then we'll just be one leg hopping around. And we'll have to find three people to have sex with. And that'll be a very inconvenient thing. So instead of doing that, what we're going to end up doing is trying to get beyond that. And the only way that we're going to be able to do that is by saying, yes, we love the gods, we think they're wonderful, and we hope that if we're really good to them, and if we give them the right kind of sacrifices, the gods will be thoughtful enough to rejoin us so we can constantly have sex all the time. That's what hope is for. If you are really hopeful and you're really good to the gods, the gods will do you a big favor and allow you to have sex constantly. That's Aristophanes' idea of human felicity, of human happiness. He's a pig. Now, let's get beyond Aristophanes. The next one who replies to him, and it's funny that Aristophanes says, I don't want anybody making jokes about my speech. Although he likes to laugh at everyone else, he's very vain and doesn't like people to laugh at him. And of course, there's, there's so many ironies written into him. If you stop and think about it and have a look at the symposium sometime, he's far and away the most comic character. The next speech comes from uh, a gentleman named Agathon. He's the guy who leads, who owns the house and who's having the party. He gives a lovely speech. And what's lovely about the speech is that it says that love is a god. So we're going to move away from the, from the devaluation of love that we get with Aristophanes. Again, we're moving up the ladder. The next speech we get with Agathon says that love is a god, that it is the source of wisdom, courage, moderation, and justice, which just happened to be the four cardinal platonic virtues that were sketched out in the Republic. It didn't get into the symposium by accident. In fact, it got there because this, the platonic corpus forms one whole set of ideas, an entire approach to the human condition. So we find out that love is full of virtue and that love is a god and such like things. And then he closes up his love little speech and people clap for him because they thought that his youthful eloquence had been very moving and he acquitted himself very well. Now Socrates comes up and in his own ironic way says, Agathon, I think that was a wonderful speech, a wonderful speech. It reminds me of a guy named Gorgias. Gorgias is one of the great sophists, one of the great liars, one of the great professional pleaders in Greece. And when Socrates says that's a wonderful speech, it reminds me of Gorgias. Right? What he's really saying is that that's a dreadful speech, but I haven't got quite time to, to straighten all the points out. He has a quick question and answer with him, and it almost immediately proves that Agathon doesn't know what he's talking about, and that it's all gibberish. But at the end of it, Socrates says, well, even if it is gibberish, don't worry about that. It was a wonderful speech. Well, we move right into Socrates' speech. What Socrates says is that he learned what he knows about love from a woman named Diotma, and that Diotma taught him that love is not a god, because gods are perfect, and love still has yearning in it. It yearns for perfection, it yearns for beauty, it yearns for completion. And the gods yearn for nothing because they are whole and, and perfect. So love is not a god. And yet love is not pure animal lust the way it is for Aristophanes. Love is a spirit, a very powerful spirit. It is a spirit which connects heaven and earth. It is a spirit which connects the profane and the sacred. It is a spirit which connects the physical and the metaphysical. It is a spirit which unifies the dissonant elements in our soul and, in the dissonant, and it unifies the dissonant elements in our relations to other people. Love, then, is something that mediates between the gods and men. Now, what's interesting about this is that most of these earlier speeches about love had been, at least implicitly, homosexual. Socrates' speech indicates that he learned about love from a woman named Diotma which is a move away from that homosexuality, but it's not a move towards heterosexuality. Don't get this wrong. Socratic love has almost nothing to do with sex. In other words, it has a physical component to it, but only the most attenuated element of physical connection. Socratic love is a union of souls. Socratic love is an attempt to create something permanent amidst the change of human life. Socratic love is an attempt to connect at the level of souls. And because the soul has no gender, 
the connection of souls is neither heterosexual nor homosexual. It is only in a very attenuated and metaphorical way sexual at all. It is the communion of two souls in an attempt to create something eternal and perfect and divine. It is an attempt to create perfection in your own soul and in the soul of your beloved. There is the wonderful passage in which Socrates says that he learned from Diotima that love is the yearning for eternity, it's the longing for immortality, and that's a beautiful poetic line. It's one of the greatest lines in the history of philosophy. Love is the yearning for eternity. It explains a lot of things. You ever seen a, a, a schoolboy carve a, a heart into a tree and say, John and Jane forever? It's easy enough to see how John and Jane got there, but you always wonder about the forever and why that should occur to a schoolboy and every schoolboy. It's because when we fall in love, there's something in us that yearns that, that this should go on forever. And that amidst the comings and goings, the construction and the destruction, the development and the retrogression of human life and human things, it offers us a glimpse of something permanent and eternal and perfect. And in fact, when we fall in love with someone else, we are not falling in love with their body. We are not falling in love with the, the meat that's there. We are falling in love with their soul, and we are falling in love with their soul only insofar as that soul gestures at something permanent and eternal and perfect and universal. And that is the form of the beautiful. If you remember the last lecture where Professor Ricuti explained to you the Platonic theory of forms, the divided line where we move up the ladder, out of the cave, to the realm of light. Well, one of the things that is up in that realm of forms is the perfectly attractive thing, the perfectly lovely thing, the perfectly excellent thing, and that is the form of the beautiful, a perfect, eternal, transcendent beauty that all people recognize and cannot help but wish to possess forever. Their lover, anytime you fall in love, you'll notice that nobody else sees why your lover is as beautiful as you think they are. The reason why is that they're looking at the body and you're looking at the soul. You see something, or at least what's hinted here, is that something that goes on forever and that only your mind or your soul can apprehend. Bodies have nothing to do with it or next to nothing to do with it. It gives you a stimulus towards thinking about the loveliness of an individual soul. From the loveliness of an individual soul, you extrapolate and you move up to the loveliness in many souls. And then from the loveliness in many souls to the loveliness in the human soul in general. And from the loveliness in the human soul, the loveliness to knowledge, to eternal things. You are moving up the cave, moving out of the realm of shadows and appearances towards reality. Diotima, in teaching him this doctrine, called the pursuit of beauty, this, this loving desire to create something permanent and eternal, calls it the ladder of beauty. The ladder of beauty is a kind of intrinsically attractive force that perfect love generates in us. It forces up, us up out of the cave, out of the world of shadows, to the realm of final appearances. Consider the following case. Go back to your grandparents. Your grandparents, when they were married, were probably 20 years old, and they are probably both beautiful, perfectly at adolescence. If they were still in love at 70, it's not because they were still beautiful. What they fell in love with was each other's souls, and the soul goes on forever. And even if they are not beautiful any longer, they still see a kind of beauty there. It hints it to them as something that goes on forever. And that's why it's possible to love someone that isn't physically around anymore. Because love, real love, refers to the soul and not the body. And whether the body is there is more or less irrelevant once you've found the true beauty and the true love, the true wisdom. Love drives us on towards philosophy, towards virtue, towards perfection. That's the message that Socrates learned from Diotima. It is very clear that Socrates is still in love with Diotima. And that, in fact, the interaction that they had between their souls and learning about the true nature of love is a perfect instantiation of what platonic love is. The reinteraction in words between Socrates and Diotima, that is, to discourse, what sex is to bodies. In other words, bodily sex generates physical immortality by creating progeny. Soul sex creates immortality by the construction of perfect beauty, perfect knowledge, perfect virtue, perfect human excellence. Diotima and her teachings have made Socrates able to understand that the path to knowledge and virtue and wisdom is paved with love and that we will not have the possibility of moving up the divided line out of the cave 
into philosophical clarity until and unless we manage to love in the way that Plato suggests that human beings are capable, in a way that, so that Aristophanes could not even imagine. Now, at the end of Socrates' speech, and it's a wonderful speech because it implicitly criticizes Aristophanes, it offers us one of the most profound and moving accounts of love in the Western tradition. The next thing and the last speech that we're going to get is that of Alcibiades. Alcibiades, the man who helped destroy his culture. Alcibiades, the democratic politician. Everyone thinks he's attractive, charming, wonderful, interesting, and lovely. The only difficulty is, is that he is not a philosopher and he's a very, very bad man. Alcibiades is also in love with Socrates and he wants to have sex with Socrates and Socrates spurns him because he has a beautiful body and an ugly soul. And that drives, Arist uh, that drives Alcibiades wild. The vanity overtakes him and he flies into a rage. He cannot control himself whenever he deals with Socrates. He bursts into the party at the end of Socrates' speech drunk, howling drunk. And again, this is the man that everyone admires, the man who can't control himself whatever. He comes in and says, gentlemen, I can't believe you're all sober. Let's get good and drunk. And here, this is the critical turning point in the dialogue. Socrates, with his speech, has been trying to bring these gentlemen, uh, these men up from the realm of appearance to the realm of reality. And now they have to make a choice. Will they go for the man with the beautiful soul or will they go for the man with the beautiful body? They go body immediately and they all start drinking. <laughs> and what's Socrates to think? What's the point of talking to these people? I mean, they're sober now. What's the point of talking to them once they get drunk? One of the funny lines in this, or one of the most ironic lines in this piece of work is that Socrates drinks heavier than anyone because they insist that he do so, but he never gets drunk ever. Which tells you something about the man with a well-organized soul, about the truly philosophical intellect. Well, drinking begins. And then Arist uh, Alcibiades is persuaded to give an encomium on Socrates and talks about his relations with Socrates. And it turns out that Alcibiades thinks very highly of himself, that he wishes to have Socrates as a lover, and he's tried to seduce Socrates several times. The only difficulty is that Socrates laughs at him, which is something that someone like Alcibiades cannot cope with. He's very vain, he's handsome, he's witty, he's articulate, he looks like Robert Redford, and Socrates turns him down, and that crushes him. Instead, Socrates says, well, to tell you the truth, I'm looking for beautiful souls, and you have a beautiful body, and your soul is really ugly. On the other hand, Socrates is known for his physical ugliness. He looks like a satyr. He's short, he's fat, he's balding, he's got a flat nose, he's an ugly guy. Why is it that everyone seems to fall in love with him? It goes to show you that a philosophical soul will out, and that in fact the true loveliness and the true attractiveness is to be found in qualities of soul, not body. So, our, so Alcibiades gives a, a long encomium on Socrates, says that he's like a satyr, Marsyas, or he's like a, man, uh, he's like a statue of the gods, Selenius. And inside the statue, when you take the top off, what you find out is actually little replicas of the gods inside. This is a recapitulation of the difference between body and soul. When you take Socrates' body away and you look at the soul, you see that inside that ugly body is a beauty of soul that nothing else in the room, nothing else in the world can match. And he says, that's how you bewitch people, Socrates. When you start talking to them, you give them the best speeches in the world, and there's something attractive about that that no one can argue with, not even me, and I'm beautiful. That's very hard for him to deal with. The consequence of his interaction with Socrates is that he feels ashamed of himself. That he says that maybe I shouldn't be engaged in democratic politics. Maybe I should perfect my soul. Now, the subtext here is this. This is being written after the Peloponnesian Wars. One of the key figures in the Peloponnesian Wars, the wars between uh, Sparta and Athens, is Alcibiades. At a critical junction in the war, he goes up in front of the people and makes a wonderful speech persuading them that the only thing to do is to attack Syracuse, which is an important city that's in Sicily. And this expedition is a complete disaster, and this expedition loses the war, and as a consequence of the advice of Alcibiades, his entire culture is destroyed. So it seems that a man who is passionate, and yet who has no concern with developing his soul and with learning, and with learning true knowledge, is going to be bad for himself and bad for his culture. He will harm himself, he will harm the people that care for him. Socrates is trying to persuade him to give up politics. Socrates is trying to make a good man of him, and he'll have none of it. And the bad influence that he exerts when he comes in makes all the other people who have been listening to him stop drinking, start drinking, makes all the other people who have been listening to him say, my, aren't you lovely, aren't you beautiful, we'd like to talk to you and listen to you. And at the end of it, all the quorum breaks up. At the end of Alcibiades' speech, a whole flood of revelers comes in. These represent the Athenian people, the demos, and they're all drunk, and they're all rowdy, and they're all sliding on in, and there's a lot of 
messing around, there's a, a terrific amount of noise, all decorum is lost, serious intellectual discussion is lost, and it turns into a big drunk. Now, of course, uh, Socrates, sitting there, having no choice but to drink with these gentlemen, does with very great misgivings, and he thinks to, he's got to be thinking to himself, Alcibiades wins the day. Everyone's really like Aristophanes. I'm trying to teach these people things, but they won't even stay sober. Even when they're sober, they're half drunk in the soul because you can't talk reason to these people. Much as Socrates would like to help them, out of love, philosophical love, concern that they should become better and not worse, he does his best to remind them of their obligations to themselves and to other people, of their capacity for perfection. And it's all undone by the pernicious influence of... Alcibiades, Aristophanes, and the Athenian people. And the only possible man who, could, man who could possibly save them is Socrates by introducing them to philosophy. And they won't listen to him. So the revelers, the people, are drinking on the night before their death because the man that they're lionizing and that they think so highly of is in fact the man that's going to lead them to doom and destruction. There's a horrible irony in that that is not comic, that is terribly, terribly serious. The last scene as it dissolves into a kind of haze, an alcoholic, inebriated haze, is Socrates, Alcibiades, and Agathon having a discussion about the nature of art and literature. On one side is Alcibiades, is Agathon, the tragic poet. On the other side is Aristophanes, the comic poet. And in between is Socrates, and at the end of it, Socrates is proving to them that the tragic poet is really the man that can write comedy, and the comic poet is really the man that can write tragedy. The implicit message of that closing scene is that the tragic poet and the comic poet have very similar kinds of souls. They're all essentially bronze men, and the fact that they are verbally gifted makes them that much more dangerous to themselves and to others. The two interlocutors that Socrates is talking to have had so much drink they, they pass out and fall headfirst on the table. Socrates throws a cloak over them so they don't get cold. He gets up and then goes back home and goes about his business for the rest of the day. It ends on a note of almost tragedy. And it's, in that respect, a sort of universal literary achievement. It has elements of tragedy, elements of comedy, elements of high art, as well as, well, low jokes. In addition to that, it brings into a profound relief the most important of the Platonic teachings about the importance of organizing one's soul, about the significance of having a political order in which philosophy is respected and cultivated, and about the importance of love, about the importance of pure, excellent emotion, as opposed to the undisciplined, lusty emotions that are characteristic of bronze men. The symposium isn't really over. All right, it's a, a dinner party that's still going on, and there's still a, um, a seat at it for you, because all of you are going to have to think about the themes that were introduced here, about how love fits into your life, about what sort of love is profitable and unprofitable, and how your emotions relate to your morality, and how morality and emotion form the good soul.